Hello, today is July 22nd, 2011. We're meeting today with Mr. William Funky at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bill, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. That's a pleasure, Brad. <laughs> Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Date of birth is April 2nd, 1925. Uh, I was born into a family of three boys and uh, three girls. And where did you fit in that? Oh, order? I was next to the last. Okay. Okay. Uh, that was in Atchison, Kansas. Right on the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. And uh, grew up there in Atchison? I, I was there till 18, till okay, I went okay. to service. Never went back after that. After there... service, I went to uh, I went into the University of Colorado, but uh, I was there 18 years. And what did your father do for a living? My father was a mechanic in a uh, foundry in Atchison, Kansas. Well, one question I always like to ask your generation before we move on to your, your military experience, mm -hmm. uh, another historical period during this time, do you have much memory and was your family affected much by the Great Depression? Oh yes, yeah, really. Now my dad had a good job. I mean, he was not out of work. Uh, we didn't have anything extra. I don't ever remember being hungry. My mother was very frugal, and she always seemed to have enough to feed the uh, people who would come by and ask for a sandwich. Uh, but my dad did two things. He was a uh, ace mechanic, so he always had a job. We lived right on the Missouri River, and they had an old bridge that the turntable, the railroad bridge, and they'd open up for the uh, steamboats to come through and that sucker would stick and nobody but he would go out there to fix it and so he gained money that way too now the strange thing about it was that I didn't know this part about him oh maybe 12 years ago 12 or 13 years ago that he would always bring home enough money to feed and clothe us so we were not hungry and then dole out what he had left to his friends who didn't have jobs. Is yes, that right? And wow. so uh, that was something never knew about my dad. I mean, he was very quiet, Yeah. never talked about it. But I, I thought that was an interesting part of the uh, the Depression years that yeah. he felt enough about his friends. That wow. He took care of them. Wow, wow. But yeah, we were affected by the Depression in that we had nothing extra. But uh, we had most things we needed, really. Hmm. So, I never had money to spend as a kid. I, I never, never had it, so I didn't miss it. Yeah, right. Although I did lose two dollars and seventy-five cents when the banks closed. <laughs> <laughs> I had a bank account of two dollars and seventy-five cents. <laughs> wow. But, uh, but that was basically it. There was a lot, a of, lot of unemployment in that area. But because it was a railroad town and a steel foundry, probably that. A town of 15,000 fared better than a lot. Wow, uh, so. I'll be darned. Mm -hmm. So you went through uh, the Atchison School System That's and graduated right. from there. Mm -hmm. And now, do you know, remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, very well. <laughs> I was in Emporia, Kansas, and I was playing in the Kansas Honor Band, which is equivalent to an all-state mm -hmm. group now. And it was during the concert the announcement came. But they didn't stop the concert. I mean, the people thought it wise not to just, until after the concert, then they announced that it was. Now, Emporia, Kansas was 150 miles from Atchison. I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. I wasn't sure I was going to get home to Atchison. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was very vivid. That was, that was the very day. The next day was vivid also. They uh, called a big um, high school meeting because all the senior boys were going to quit school and go down and join the Army. And they called a, a meeting saying, you need to stay in school, they're not ready for you yet. And that's, they calmed that little exodus down yeah. that way. But, and you they, were, they're all going to go. You were a sophomore or a junior? I was a junior. Junior, okay. Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, yeah. But that was, uh, that was kind of indicative of the time of the men. They felt it was their duty and they were ready. Yeah, wow. And they, and they were irritated. <laughs> oh, uh, but, but that was that was basically it. Yeah. And then, so you finished high school. Uh, during this time, there was uh, 
talk a little bit about rationing and, and such? Uh, did oh, that yes. go into? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, family never owned a car, so gasoline rationing was not a problem. Sugar was. Um, some other items were shoes, things like that. Although I thought the shoe rationing was kind of a joke. At that time, who bought, you had four pair a day, a year. You could buy four pair of shoes. Nobody bought four pair of shoes in a year, but you still had that ticket. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but that was basically it. Uh, I don't recall meat being rationed, although there wasn't much of it. And, uh, but mainly it was gasoline and sugar at the time. Mm. And uh, if you had gasoline stamps, it seems to me my dad got a hold of them some way. Then you could trade them for something else. Right, right, right. A barter system. Mm -hmm. So then you went, uh, finished out through high school. I did. Uh, take uh, your story, then what'd you do after high school? Uh, well, I went right into the Army, almost out of the graduation time. Oh, so you would have been 18 then? Uh, or did uh, the next year, 1943. 43, okay, yeah, yeah. they put you at 18. Okay, okay. Yeah. so you were drafted almost right away, well, or did I was, you enlist? Was that, yes, I was on the draft list to come up, but then they had a thing at that time called um, voluntary induction. So I volunteered induction and went right away. Instead of just sitting around with waiting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think the majority of my friends did the same thing. So. And what service branch did you enlist in? Army. Army. And why did you choose that branch over oh, the I other? I didn't choose. Oh, you didn't? Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> when you were drafted, you, you went. Now, if they found people they wanted for other services, then they put them in there. But, uh, no, I went to Fort Leavenworth, and that was pure Army. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> And how soon then after uh, you got your notice or whatever, did you, did you shoot, send, shoot off to, to, to Leavenworth? About six weeks. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. And did you leave alone or did you go with buddies? Or was, it was there... I went, well, there were others there, but they weren't my particularly close friends. Oh, okay. But uh, there were a lot of us on the train that went that night to Leavenworth. Okay. But, and then from what Leavenworth? Uh, is that, that just processing, or did you do just your boot camp? No, just processing, and then we went to Camp Roberts, California. Oh, really? Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, how was that? I mean, I would imagine, like many in your generation, growing up, you didn't really travel too far away from home. No, we didn't. Now you're going clear to the West Coast. That's uh, right. What was that experience? Was there any tinge of uh, homesickness or anything along that line? The train went from Leavenworth north through Missouri, and I could see the hills almost see my house from the train. Wow. That was the one time of tinge that struck me. After that, it kind of disappeared. Yeah, that's good. So, and, and then how was that transition going from civilian life to military life for you? Well, it didn't seem particularly hard for me. <clears throat> I'd been sick most of my life with asthma and bronchial asthma. When I got into service, it disappeared. Yeah, yeah. And it was the first time in my life I felt good. And strange to say, I almost enjoyed basic training hmm. because I felt healthy and well. So it, it was not a big change. Was it the training or the change of atmosphere? Change of or atmosphere. Uh, yeah. Atchison had flour mills and things, and I think that was where it came from. Huh. But uh, no, I did not have a. Uh, and I really never felt homesickness during basic training. It was all new, it was kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah. I was too stupid to know what was coming up. <laughs> uh, and then from uh, basic, uh, you're what, six, six or eight weeks or so in basic, and then where'd you oh, go from 17. there? 17. Se oh, really? Long basics then. Well, long basics. Hmm. I trained in artillery and became an artillery crew chief. And that's what I thought I was going to do. Army then established a program called ASTP, which is Army Specialized Training which was supposedly modeled after the Navy's P-12, which mm -hmm. was very successful. The Army's was not. Mm -hmm. It was too late for one thing, and it was really disorganized. It was really, I guess they thought uh, they were going to make all engineers out of all of us, I guess, mm -hmm. which was ridiculous in itself. It was only in that from um, December to mid-January, and then they closed the program. Uh, they sent us to uh, first ASTP to Las Cruces, New Mexico. And then from Las Cruces, when they closed the program, they took a lot of the AST people and put them in armored divisions. And the closest armored division was in Abilene, Texas, the 12th Armored Division. 
<clears throat> yeah, from what I understand from that program, I mean, you had to be, uh, there's a number of, uh, quite a bit of testing, you had to be fairly intelligent, uh, from a, a, a pretty high IQ to get into it, and then what happened, I guess they canceled, the, they foresaw a shortage of soldiers and canceled the program and... They needed bodies more than yeah. they needed engineers. Yeah. yeah. Most of us never knew why we were there. Hmm. We took that Army general test, we went in, never heard of them, but didn't they? And all of a sudden say, you, you, and you are on the train and go. Hmm. But uh, it, it didn't last long. Yeah, yeah. So now you're you're in Abilene, Texas, and, a, and training to, uh, in the uh, artillery? Uh, no. Uh, first, I went, when you went through the line, they put me in the 23rd Tank Battalion. And I told the sergeant, I said, well, I'll go, but I won't be there long. I said, terrible claustrophobia. I couldn't be in a tank. And so he got very angry. And he wrote INF, infantry, period. Oh, no. So I was in an infantry battalion, ar armored infantry, excuse me, armored infantry battalion. Which means, can you define what that? Well, that meant you had half tracks to ride in. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. So, but you did a lot of walking. <laughs> and how long then were you down in Abilene? Uh, from um, January till September. And then we uh, went to Camp Shanks and to uh, uh, Liverpool, England. Well, let me let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. Here's uh, here's a boy from landlocked Kansas uh, crossing uh, the Atlantic. What was that crossing like for you? Was uh, did you get your uh, sea legs, or how was that? Well, it was not particularly rough. I thought th you said was I anxious? I was anxious there because I would see the uh, convoy ships moving and all of a sudden you'd see them dart off someplace and you thought well there's something out there that oh, wow. you don't like and so you worry you, here you're sitting with a, a liner with 12,000 men sitting ducks you know but the uh, destroyers were always around us all the way but it was not particularly rough so it, it didn't bother us a lot and how long would how long did it take that crossing i think it was about seven days yeah a ship of 12,000 men what uh, it had to be packed Yes, it was. It was an old German. Well, it had been built for uh, the Kaiser for World, after World War One for a uh, victory present, except the victory didn't come. And then it was used here and there. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just read a thing in the Smithsonian about it recently. It was used in the Great Japan Earthquake of 1923 as a hospital ship right off the uh, coast of Japan. Wow. I didn't even know about that. What, a what, was the name, what was the name of the ship? The Empress of Australia. And I understand it was re-outfitted after the war and still used. It. And it was a luxury ship, or I imagine when it was built it was a luxury. But I imagine the accommodations were far from luxurious. Oh, luxurious. 12,000 men jammed into that. <laughs> Sorry, no. How did, you, how did you guys uh, spend your time that week, uh, or that crossing? Walking Kill around the deck. I couldn't read because I'd get seasick if I read, as long as I was walking, I was okay. And most guys just kept walking. And they tried to have calisthenics and stuff like that, which didn't go for too well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and from what I understand, you guys were fed twice a day, and it was just a continuous line of what? Pretty, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. That's where we got to, it was run by the British. Oh, geez. so we got... British food, oh, which boy. we hated. <laughs> I have a great t distaste for marmalade from that time. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and you landed in Liverpool? L uh, Liverpool. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, we spent some time in a, near a town named Tidworth. There were some barracks there, and we uh, did some more training there before we went to La Havre, across to La Havre. Now, during this time, were you allowed to <clears throat> you know, leave to get into London or got into mingle London. with any of the locals? In London once, yeah. Not with the locals, really, because they kept you busy when you're in there. But uh, we got into London once, and it was a night. That was when I heard my first buzz bomb. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Didn't know what it was then, but we heard it keeping going over. And I know somebody said, as long as you hear it going, don't worry. If you hear that engine cut off, then you got worries. But, uh, but we were going to go to the um, Siegmund Miller oh, wow. stage door canteen. But it was so packed you couldn't get in with the blocks. But they had speakers outdoors. And there you're standing in the street in the Black House listening to Glenn Miller's music. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, uh, 
and there was quite a bit of damage in London from the previous bombings and yeah, yeah. oh yeah, lots. When we were there during the day, you could see it, you know. But uh, I think it was the uh, subways that amazed me when you went down the subways, and that's where people were living. Actually, living, they had their whole families in a corner, and they had bunks or beds or chairs. Mm, wow, that's. Well, it sounds like uh, growing up, and from what I know about uh, your post years here in Fort Collins, that music was a very important part of your life. Were you able to to play anything during this time? Did you? I don't know what instrument you played. If you could bring that along with you, or uh, uh, no, I didn't. I, I I really didn't care anything about it then. I was oh, kind okay. of enthralled. I was going to join the band in uh, Camp Barkley, Texas, because they said they needed clarinet players. I thought that'll be the thing. Until we had a force march, 30 mile force march one night. We started at 1 in the morning. As I understand, I don't know if this is true, but I, th I think it's true because some told me that they saw it happen, that we actually lost some men who died on that march, and others, their legs cramped up, and they had ambulances. And uh, we ended up with a friend of mine having somebody between us, you know, his arms over our shoulders. I was little and skinny, so I didn't get hurt. It seemed to be the big men that got mm. hurt on things like that. And as we came into it, we'd been up from one o'clock going through storms and all things like that. And uh, who met us at the, the gate? At the 12th Armored Division Band, and the general who wanted to wanted us to march in step back to our battalion area. I learned more <laughs> words. <laughs> And I'd ever heard in my life. And I thought, I don't want any part of that outfit. Those guys haven't even been up two hours yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I just said, forget it. Too. Wow. Uh, but no, I didn't play in the army. So uh, we'll, go, we'll jump back here now. You're in England. What time period was, roughly time period, was that you were in England before you went over to, over to France? Yeah, it was September to November. Of uh, 44? Okay, so D-Day had already happened. And, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so we landed at Lahar. Lahar. They were, it was a very busy seaport then, you know, for, for equipment. And then you started working your way across France. Yeah. Take your story down from there. Through, down through Paris. We went down through Paris. Hmm. We didn't see action until we were almost in the Alsace region down by Lundville. And uh, that, was, that was our first action. We just did training across and... I don't even remember any mop-ups along the way. It had been pretty well sealed off by then. Was but, there quite a bit of uh, damage? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. A lot of damage. I know we had uh, a Thanksgiving service in a bombed-out church, which was just nothing but four walls, no roof, you know. Hmm. But, uh, that, that was, but at Loonville was when we first, after that, we first were put into to action. And how was that first time? I mean, going into battle and what? Uh... I thought it was scary. Yeah. Uh, we were carrying so much equipment. That's another thing I couldn't imagine. Why we were carrying so much stuff? We need. Well, they figured we weren't coming out very soon, but we didn't need that. And uh, we uh, started being shelled as soon as we got out of the half tracks and started walking up to the first uh, point. And the other, and I think it was the 36th Division was going out, we were relieving the 36th Division. And uh, that was a scary night. I, I tried to dig a hole, but it was pretty hard <laughs> by then. See, that was the problem. See, that winter was the supposedly the coldest. worst winter in 50 years. Right, the coldest winter. Yeah. 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 Well, were you guys properly clothed? And, and for, no. For... No. The uh, powers that be thought the war was going to be over by December. Yeah, yeah. And we still had leather boots, leather, uh, leather, not leggings, if I don't know what they call the leather around your leg. But that froze feet, you know, and they'd shrink when they get wet. Uh, just had a combat jacket, had no lining, and uh, if you could find a, uh, a blanket, you'd try to cut it up and sew it in there. No, we were not clothed for winter at oh. all. As a matter of fact, I don't know if it's true or not, but I think it is that we lost almost as many men with frozen feet as we did anything else. Wow. And it wasn't until just oh, shortly, maybe two, three weeks after we went into combat, that they finally got shoe packs to us where you could put a lot of socks 
and uh, that's that saved it. But they were not ready, not wow. ready at all. And you're living out in the elements. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's a question I always amazes me. I mean, I, I look at the conditions you guys were in. You weren't properly clothed. You're living out in the elements. Probably weren't getting enough sleep. Probably weren't eating as well. Hygiene wasn't so good. I think any one of those would bring a, a man down, but on top of that, you had the umbrella of war. How do you think you made it through that period? You know, that's a very strange thing. I remember very little about hygiene. I don't even remember considering it. I don't ever remember being hungry. I mean, if you had a can of sea ration, can of whatever it was, it seemed to satisfy you. You had other things to think about, I guess. Uh, and I think most men were the same way. It was just a, an ex, not an excitement. That's not a good word. Living off anticipation of something that you, you had to do, and what was on the other side. You know, I think that's what kept you going more than anything else. Now, at times when we were stalled, they would get meals to us. They, they would have uh, cook trucks. That they would get some meals to us. I don't remember I was what they were, but I knew they were better than can't see rations. Uh, water was always a problem. I remember being thirsty all the time, you know, and uh, it wasn't around. But, uh, hmm. but it was. Any time you could get any kind of shelter, any kind of a house or anything. If we went into a small town, and that was, that always bothered me when you commandeered a house or something. But those people, that's what with the flow, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, yeah this. We were housed in, well, when we had, had captured some German barracks, we were in there for a little while, so we were in, but with no heat or anything, you're always, that's it, the cold was a prevailing thing. That's the one thing I think we all remember more than anything yeah, else, is yeah. the cold. And, yeah. uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I look at my own situation where I've worked outside or I've camped or something, and I've always known, well, either that evening or the next day, I'm going to be yeah. home into a warm bed and a hot shower. I can't imagine going weeks on end yeah. in conditions like That's that. Right. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. you, uh, you get used to whatever you have to do. And I think there were fears that kept you going. I know when you'd stand guard duty at night, incident of guard duty, we always went training, we already two hour stints, you know, two on, four off, two on, four off. But in that situation, they were always only 30 minutes long because that's all you could take is standing for 30 minutes. Cause it's like, you know, people say uh, pheasant highs, I think, pheasant hunting. You'd hear noises that weren't really there or you'd see things in the dark that really weren't there. So 30 minutes was about, about, about what you could stand and then change guards. You know? But you, you just made the comparison to the guard training back or the guard duty back during training. How do you, as you look back on it now, how do you think, uh, what do you think of your training in comparison to once you got into battle? Do you think it helped, it prepared you for battle, or how would you compare that? I think our last training in Camp Barkley with the 12th Army Division was superior. We had a company commander that was, uh, strangely enough, he was only 22 years old. He was the youngest combat company commander in the American Army. A lot of people didn't like him because he was kind of spit and polished. He was not like a patent, but kind of that kind of thing. But he knew what he was doing, and he trained hard, and he took nothing. I mean, he was in command of men 15 years older than he. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of them almost his own age, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I, I think it was a very, very fine command, uh, combat training. He didn't leave anything to chance. He didn't, so. Hmm. And then once you guys went into battle, was it straight out from there, or would you get pulled back for R&R &R at all, or? Yeah, you would occasionally. Uh, let's see, if I can't remember how long we were on the first one. But it was little stages of me, you'd take this, and then you could uh, be quiet for a while. And then there'd be something else, there'd be go in in the morning and then nothing would happen the rest of the day, then you'd go night and then something like that. So far as being pulled clear back, it was quite a while before we got back to a town where we could uh, do it. But that was the time we were in the Maginot Line area and we were 
walking through the Maginot Line. And uh, I think our first attacks, I mean, our first attack was, you know, the first attack was very kind of strange and, in that we thought we were going to walk into it and there was a machine gun nest that held mm. us down. Finally, they brought up a tank and they took care of this machine gun nest. And that night we were in a little barrack area and I think the chaplain came around and said, do you have somebody named Funky in here? And they said, yeah, he's over there. So he handed me a German canteen and the name Funky was scratched on the top of it. Oh, was that right? And I carried it for a long time, but I got away from me someplace. <laughs> he says, meet your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But that was it. But, but then the next attack into uh, the Maginot Line area, again, we were um, pinned down for a long time. That's when we first learned about the difference between the American machine gun and the German machine gun. They really weren't very good. I mean, oh, really? our American machine guns. They had an air cooled, air cooled, uh, thirty caliber machine gun that would get hot. And it would start out and get, <laughs> <laughs> get hot and stall in the water too. But that German machine would just go. Brr, brr, brr. That's why they called it the burp gun. Right, right, okay. And so they had those, and uh, we, we lost some men that time that we went up. We had to go up that hill. But they were on top of a hill right in front of the Maginot Line pillboxes. But uh, we got it done, and then we went on to, from there into some, uh, to another small town. I think, I, no, that's Rohrbach or someplace else. I don't remember the name of the first one. Luckily, for me, I had a almost a fatal accident in that uh, I, I was uh, a friend of mine, and I were first scouts. We were the lead guy in front of the platoons, which basically meant you do you were the one to draw fire yeah. to see where they were for. But we were carrying those little grease guns, little submachine grease guns, which were worthless to scouts. Absolutely worthless. Why they ever did it, I don't know. But we went through and then we had a night attack. And finally we got through the night attack and nothing much happened. A few grenades into the pillbox and things like that. Luckily I didn't have to use a gun. I went to clean it and there was I had evidently fallen because there was a core of mud in that barrel. But now had I ever had the fires, that'd been it, you know. Now the good Lord was looking out for me, I'll yeah, tell wow. you, because wow. I don't remember falling. But I had time enough to find that to get it out of there before I needed it. It's wow. A, wow. So, no, but back to our company commander, I had greatest respect for him. Because he had just given the order the first scouts will not carry an M1 rifle. Incidentally, I have one in my closet. Oh, really? So, yeah. And uh, worthless, I mean. You see something out there, and. So he called us in after that attack, Alton and I, and he said, uh, did you get any of the, as the Germans, they went across the hill. He said, how could we? We had that burp gun and we're down here. He said, we're not going to carry those anymore. He said, that's an order, you will carry it. And he said, well, we may start out with them, but it won't be long, we'll find a rifle someplace. That afternoon, the order come down, scouts will carry a rifle. So that's why I had the greatest respect, I mean, he went to bat for us against higher right, yeah. echelon. You know? Yeah. But, uh, huh. How, how, can you describe if you remember your feelings? I mean, for someone like myself that has never been in battle, what what you're thinking is you, as for example, you're marching into to the front lines. What are you thinking? You're going. You you know you're going into harm's way. What's going through your mind, and then, and then, when you're in the thick of battle, I mean, to me, there's three stages. You're, you're, you're going into the battle. You're in the thick of battle, and then when the battle's over, and you, and you've pulled back or something, you've got some downtime. How do you decompress from something like that? Or, or... well, I think going into sometimes we have the same feeling we do when we step in a car. We can't have a wreck. We're not going to have a wreck today, but okay. we might. I think that's really the only thing. It's going to happen to George over here, or John over here, but it's not going to happen to okay. me. But now there are times that it gets pretty darn close that you think it can't happen to you. And I never had that feeling until our last 
battle at Hurlesheim just before we were captured the afternoon before. I was knocked down twice in that afternoon. They were knocking out tanks all around us. But I wonder, why didn't they pull those tanks back? They're breaking through that crust in the ground and they're just picking them off. And uh, this mortar shell came in and uh, it floored me and I kind of shook my head and got up. And a little later, another one came down again. And uh, I knew what was going on, but I couldn't say anything. And somebody ran over and hollered at me and said, help the lieutenant. I'd been talking to one of the lieutenants, probably between us here, maybe a little further than that. And then they said, no, he can't, he's out too. I mean, I could hear him say it, but I couldn't do it. Really? No. Yeah. There's a concussion. Now, the strange thing was, it wasn't until about five years ago, I found out it wasn't a mortar shell. Because we had a man at the... Uh, reunion and I told him about that I said you know that mortar got me twice and that's third time I thought was a charm I began to worry after that he said that wasn't a mortar shell he said it was an 88 shell went right between you and the lieutenant he said because I saw it hit the ground right back of you and I said you thought I had been thinking all these years that mortar he said yeah but it wasn't I saw it wow so the concussion of that shell going by us I began to get a little bit leery about it. <laughs> Boy, and those 88s were terrifying from what I understand. Oh, they were, yeah. Terrifying, they this were very be, accurate. He said it happened to be an armor-piercing shell. It had been explosive, because they would put a, first put an armor-piercing shell in a tank, then an explosive shell would follow it. Wow. So this was the armor-piercing. Now, we really thought that they were 88s on personnel later that afternoon when we kept coming, you know. And, uh, and, and for those that will watch this tape, the 88 started out as their anti-aircraft, and they, right. they, they turned them down on, on, on accurate, the ground. Accurate, just like a rifle almost. Oh, that. boy. So, oh, jeez. Uh, uh, they, they, they were, de were deadly. Hmm. Of course, we had another problem on that attack, and we were told, don't fire into the woods. And the question was, why not? There's somebody in there firing at us. But the, there again, that heat of battle, you know, things don't go the way you think they're going to go. The 56th Infantry was already, they thought was already in those woods and they cleared it. Well, the 56th had been thrown out and they didn't know it. So they were still in, holed up in those woods, but they had told us, don't shoot in there. Finally, we found it was, and then they called in the P-47s and they bombed and stra strafed it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Wow. That was my first uh, experience with the plane strafing above us. That must have been a sight. It was exciting. Yeah. Because we thought, man, those guys can do better than we are. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. Now, how was it as far as, uh, as you guys are moving along the lines and then later when you were captured, communications with back home? I mean, were you getting mail and, and, and writing, being able to send mail out? Or how, did, how would that work when you really weren't in the... I really one? think the last letters I got was when we were in, uh, just crossed into La Harve. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. And I didn't have any after that. Huh. But, uh, so, you could write those V-mails, you've yeah. seen those little V-mail uh -huh. things, you know, that were always edited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was, that was pretty much it. No, again, the uh, example of military history again, or military history, military, history, military uh, intelligence was played a big uh, role in uh, the capture. The decim decimation of our whole battalion was just, uh, I think I mentioned that at the uh, dinner that we started out with a company of 300 men and we were told that was about what there was inside. We thought, there again, the fo folly of youth, you know, we're, they're no match for us. Well, there were because there we found out. And I just read it again this afternoon, a little thing. There was an SS Panzer Division in there. There wasn't a company of men. But, uh, but uh, we got in and found out what we couldn't do. Well, take your story forward then from, okay. from, from there. Well, I was a runner for the battalion commander, who I also had a great respect for. Had one, thought he had one fault, and if it would be that he was too close to the front. 
I thought he might have been a little more effective if he were a little farther back observing. But that was just Colonel Logan. He just he wanted to be there with the men. You know. It wasn't until about, we went in about just at dawn and we got in. We got about a third of the town cleared and got in. And uh, as his runner, and of course the runner was the one who took messages if, if uh, radio communication failed. And one of my first assignments was to find the 23rd Tank Battalion. And looking back and looking at maps, I think I was sent the wrong direction because I looked and looked and I tried to go through the town and they'd spot me and I'd have to go around someplace else to get around them and finally went back. Then I got back and it was about 10 o'clock in the morning and he was asking permission to leave because he saw what had we gotten into. And they said, no, stay there and mm. attack. So we stayed and they stayed and uh, the outposts were there and I kept trying to communicate with the outposts. I always felt, and particularly at night, I always felt the Germans were letting me go. And they'd watch where I'd go. Oh, and then wow. they might, might be able to find another outpost. I've, I've always had that feeling in my mind that, that that's why I'm alive, that they let me go. Really? I think oh, I was being, being a Judas goat, you know. <clears throat> and he asked for permission again oh, in the afternoon, mid-afternoon. It was getting worse. And they still said no. Then when it got to dark, my job was to go find these outposts and pull them back toward the battalion uh, command post. And I never got all of them. I know I didn't. I got some of them. But uh, I think it was about 10 o'clock. He said, asked for the last time for permission. We thought we could at least get these people out, you know. And they said no again. They said at midnight the ammunition, because we're out of everything, but the, the ammunition tr track will be out. And he gave the coordinates, and he said then, uh, I think it was B Company, will be up to help you at the, the dawn. And, and these are quotes, I can, these are, put into my brain. His answer was that uh, he said send up the ammo track but let those guys sleep. We won't be here. Wow. wow. And then he destroyed the radio and that was it. And that was very shortly because we were in the post and they brought a, a tiger tank right up to the door where we were. And uh, by then they had been throwing grenades. I'd, the first grenade that came in was a white phosphorus. I got I don't know how I ever got it off so fast because white phosphorus really goes in, but and so I thought it must not have been very good white phosphorus. So I just brushed it off. But then the next when the um, explosive grenade came into this little area where I was, and that uh, my only wound was in the hand. I got a little shrapnel was all, but uh, by then he he knew it was why let these people just be slaughtered. Let's take our chance. And, you surrendered then? Surrendered then. Okay. Mm -hmm. and that, uh, How was, uh, what's going through your mind at this point now that, uh, I mean, it just seems like, it's, well, pretty much like well, anything, sure it's the unknown, well, but. Uh, I think most of us figured they were going to do us in as soon as we surrendered. We felt that. We were kind of surprised they weren't. And I often wondered if it had been just the common soldier, they might have. But that SS group, you know, was. It's kind of like a professional club. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was. Then we were so tired it didn't matter. That was, that was the whole thing. We were all so tired we, we, we didn't. And I think that's how I felt. I don't care. I don't care. Because I really thought I made my peace. Because I thought the next one coming in, it's, it's it. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, how many of you were left and how many were taken prisoner roughly? <laughs> You know, I could I could have gone, and I was going to do that after that thing in Loveland, because as I recall, we started out with some 320 men, plus the tanks, which is more. And I think about 35 or 40 of us were left after that time. They, a lot had been wounded and taken back during that day. Wow. But, uh, but, uh, so that was, that was scary. Wow. And where did they take you once they you were captured? They took us across the Rhine, 
And I remember very vividly, I was so thirsty. You know, I said I don't remember being hungry, mm -hmm. but thirsty all the time. And I don't know what was in that Ryan, all kinds of stuff by then, but I know the, that water out of the helmet, just drinking the water straight out of the Rhine. It tasted pretty good. Wow. <laughs> the, wow. Then they, we walked through a place called Baden Baden, which is a, a great resort place now. Mm -hmm. And that was our first interrogation there. That's when I learned how, what my name meant. He said, to the interrogator, so you're German. I said, no, I'm not German. He said, well, your name is Funke? And I said, yeah. He said, well, that's German. I said, well, that's it. <laughs> That's, then they tried to scare us. I don't know. My best friend, I could see, walked by the window. He saw me in there and then he says, See you, Funky. And they were taking him someplace. And it was shortly after that, he was not, shortly after that we heard a machine gun go. Ooh. And I think they were trying to scare oh, us. Oh, right. And they didn't do anything because he lived later, he lived in Ely, Minnesota. And then, you know, I can't recall how far we walked. They put us on a train and we went to. Uh, Ludwig's, Ludwig's Haven, Ludwig's Haven, near Stuttgart. And we were there for a time as an old stable kind of a thing. Then we were put on a train again and we were sent to North Germany, near Bremen. And I think it was either four days and three nights or three days and four nights in that boxcar, which was so crowded we could not all sit down at one time. It was impossible to lie down because had so many. You had to take turns sitting, and that was uh, that was pretty gross. <laughs> Did they provide uh, food or water during that time? They, as I recall, once a day they they shoved something through the little window. There was just two little windows, the mm -hmm. one on mm -hmm. opposite corners of the car. Uh, they must have provided water somewhat, but I don't recall that. I remember the bucket in the corner. And if they'd ever stopped, somebody hand them the bucket, you know. But that was it. Wow. <laughs> to, wow. So and then we got to Fallen Basel, which was Tallog 11B, which I read just recently in a, in a history. And it was partly a German history book. They claimed that that particular camp was, was considered to be the worst in Germany. Really? Partly, I think, because we had all the we had Americans in there. We didn't have any airmen because those were all kept in a separate camp. And but there were Russians and Mongols and Serbs and Indians and everything and, else. Were you mingled together? Or were you kept separate? No, we yeah. were kept separate. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> we were kept separate. But a friend of mine and I found a way because we, a man came up to us and started talking to us, a Russian, and the Russian compound was right next to us. And so we found a way we could squeeze under the, nobody was looking, we'd squeeze under the fence and then go into the compound and talk with him. Really? Oh, wow. <clears throat> and it's very interesting. There's a Russian engineer, a young man, Russian engineer, well, he could have been too young, because he had told us that he had been one of the engineers on big, deeper river dams in Russia. And uh, he didn't talk about his family, he just talked about his himself and about his country. And when we saw that the war was coming, well, ending, you know, and uh, like I mentioned, all those B-17s going unopposed both directions, you knew it was about over. And that was your indication? I mean, you Yeah, were, we, we knew, we knew, and oh, they okay. had no air support, they had no way of stopping those 17s going back and forth. So we're talking, day. we're talking late winter, spring of 45 then? April. April, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we were talking to this man, and uh, I think I said, well, I'm sure you'll be anxious to get out and you can go to your homeland. And he said, no, I can't, I can't go home. He said, I'll be killed immediately. And I said, well, why would you be killed? I mean, you're an engineer, you did this. He says, I know too much. So I never thought about it until we went back later one time and he said, you know, now this is 45. Mm -hmm. He said, your country will be fighting my country in some way in five years. Wow. When did the Korean War yeah, start? Yeah, 50. Yeah. Five years. Yeah. I thought, whoa, <laughs> maybe he didn't know too much. You know? We never saw him when we were liberated, but I'm sure he ran west. I'm sure he didn't go east, I'm sure. But 
I've thought about this man periodically since 1945, where he went, or how he got, or did he get to America, or what did he do, you know? Ah, uh, wow. But, uh, wow. yeah, my, my political thing was changed after talking with him. I'll be done. Wow. But, uh, but the liberation was exciting. Well, uh, before we get to that, mm -hmm. you, you talked about it being described as one of the worst camps. Yeah. Talk about the conditions in the camp. Well, we were in kind of a big flat one floor. The only heat was one wood stove in the middle, and it didn't heat. There was a cold winter. Uh, as far as sleeping, they had tiers of bunks, and the bunks are about three feet wide. And two men slept. Two. Yes. And so when you had to turn over, you'd wrap the guy on the shoulder and said, shift, and so you could turn over. There was nothing on them, just the boards. One end of them was inclined like a pillow, so you had given up. And you'd put a jacket or something, if you would, but usually you needed the clothes over you. But the body heat, I suppose, kept you going. The food we were fed once a day was a a little bowl of soup and a little piece of black bread about two by two. It's strange how long you can eat, eat on a piece of bread that's two inches cubed. <laughs> I once had the uh, recipe that they found in that German area, how they made that, and I think it was about 30% sawdust. Oh, geez. <laughs> and the soup was a bigger soup. And I imagine that got worse and worse and worse towards the end when they were starting to run out of... They were, they were running out, I know. But the strange thing was there was an SS barracks not, close, uh, not far. And as soon as it, we were liberated, we had been told, don't get out and mess around, you'll get in our way, you know, we don't have any equipment for you, just because we'll get you out of here in three days, which they did. Uh, but it was time enough to get to those... Uh, German barracks, they found a lot of oatmeal. So those guys just scooped up oatmeal and brought it back and had little fires and made oatmeal. Hmm. And, uh, uh, but the, and again, the sanitation. It was just an open pit latrine and a wire between and, uh, and the Russians and whoever, it was, I suppose it was about as wide as this room and just a little trickle of water running down below, and, uh, and the group sitting over the log on that side, group sitting over the log. We never understood where the women in the Russian compound came from. Then they would be there too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And you can imagine the odors, and it was just... So there was no sanitation whatsoever. We had one shower, as I recall, in the three and a half months. and. Uh, so, but you know, at that time we didn't know really about the Holocaust and about the, the people being told they were going to take a shower. And the, oh, uh, right, yeah, yeah, right. Had we known, we probably wouldn't have been too excited yeah. about that first yeah. shower. Yeah, right, right. But uh, there was one shower and we, we slept in our clothes. We never took them off, you know. And, and in, in those conditions, you never succumbed to any of the diseases that... Uh, Brought on with those kind of conditions? Some of the guys had a lot of dysentery and thing. I never never did really. I had a last bite that infected that went up my leg, but uh, that disappeared. And uh, I think a German doctor gave me some ointment or something just to put on the bite. That did it. But, uh, it seemed like the big men suffered more than a little hmm. because they burned up their own fat. I was a little and skinny. I didn't have any to burn. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I didn't need as much to go on. Gotcha. Okay. As I did. So they were they fared better. And were you receiving uh, Red Cross packages or anything like that? I think we got one that I recall, and that was good. If you didn't smoke, you could trade cigarettes for chocolate bar mm -hmm. or whatever. But I only recall one Red Cross box. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so. Mm. And I imagine uh, your folks probably got the telegram that you'd been missing in action or taken prisoner, or how did... Uh, yeah, I still got it laying around. Is that table. right? Yeah. And the one that says that I've been returned to military. Well, they didn't call it liberations, they said returned to, to military control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, 
But they didn't know that. That was from January till almost April. Well, January till late April when they got there. So. Oh, I can't imagine what must have been going through their minds. Well, uh, it went through a lot of people's minds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah and I, I have a f talked to a man not too long ago, and he he really questioned the involvement of people in World War II, you know. And he just really didn't believe that everybody was involved. I said, Bill, if you lived on this block, if this block were here then, You'd walk down, and there'd probably be only one or two houses that didn't have a little flag with either a blue star or a gold cool. star. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he just, huh. it's a little hard to, he mm. said, well, he says, I don't see how they were involved. I said, first of all, everybody went. I mean, it wasn't, do you want to go? He says, see me next, we'll be by to pick you up, you know, kind of a thing. So they were involved. Yeah. And I said they were involved whether they're in the army or not. The school kids are involved. The scrap drives yeah. and the victory gardens and. Do you know uh, a writer here in town? Her name is mine, uh, Teresa Funk. Uh -huh. They, they uh -huh. say Funk. Do you know Teresa? Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, she's a good writer. Yeah. Have you read her books? <laughs> so and she does the one about the children, what they did during the war. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Yeah. Mm. So. They, they were involved, but everybody seemed to want to be. I mean, I worry now if we were ever faced with that situation, what we would have. I, I really worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Neither of my two sons were in the military. They were not the right age. Uh, one of them could have been, I guess, during the Vietnam War, which I supported at the beginning, fully. And I supported it because that Russian, that Russian that told me they were going to be fighting yeah. because I just figured it was an extension at Korea, which I still do. And I supported it till I found out that they were, those men were not being supported mm. and allowed to do. Yeah. And then I went the other way. Mm. So. Mm. Well, getting back to, uh, to the camp, uh, what would you guys do to pass time in the last three months? Somebody was able to get some... The British somehow got some magazines, I remember, into our compound one time that we would use, read. And uh, there were three British men who were in show business of some kind, and they would come around and entertain us and sing to us, you know. So oh, wow. Kind of funny. Uh -huh. But uh, we just mainly sit around and talk. Was there any plans or talks of trying to escape, uh, as you see in the movies? Or uh... well, you know, one time they dropped in leaflets and said, "Stay where you are," uh, because again, you know, we just get in the way of anybody trying to do something, yeah. and you probably yeah. hurt and. Uh, and that usually came when they started dropping these um, metal foil things to spoil the radar mm -hmm. or something, you mm -hmm. know. And they would drop in leaflets, so we're not far behind, it's coming. So don't get in our way, just stay there, hang on. And I think that stopped a lot of them. Now, some of the other camps, I understand they did. But, uh, but I know, didn't know of anybody who, at least in our compound, that did. Yeah. And how do you feel about your uh, uh, your captors? Did, do they, you think you were treated fairly? Uh, any animosity towards your treatment or the, of them then and, and now as, as you look back Again, on it? Again, I think it's probably because of the SS, you know. They were almost professional soldiers. Uh, and at that time, they knew the end was near. And that's what I was, and I understand that the men who were in long before we were, had more problems oh, really? than we did, but, but they, they could see the end coming. And uh, when it was really close and the guards disappeared and the, and the camp commander, who was really reminded me of Colonel Clink. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I look back at him and this was a Colonel Clink. 
for those that are watching, yeah, he, Colonel Clink was on the TV uh, comedy series yeah, Hogan's Heroes. Hogan's Heroes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the camps were nothing like Hogan's yeah, Heroes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he called a camp meeting, you know, and uh, said he, he had to leave us now. And actually wished us well. Is that right? And then he disappeared. I don't know why. why. I think he probably went west also. Really? Because I don't think any of them wanted to go east. <laughs> but, uh, now, being up north, were you liber liberated by the British or British? Amer British okay. 8th Army. Okay. And it was kind of like they had uh, scored it in Hollywood. I mean, we knew they were coming, and the guys gathered around the gates, and the tanks came in, and the tank comes through the uh, gate, breaks the gate down, and British GI standing on the front of the tank telling us what to do and we're going to get you out of here in, in three days if we can. Just stay put. Don't get, don't get in our way. That's basically what I said. Uh -huh. And again, it was not until about 10 years ago that I knew that that was Montgomery. Is that right? It was Montgomery. Wow. He, was, he was leading the charge. Huh. <laughs> but, uh, of course, we didn't know a lot about Montgomery. We didn't know the animosity between yeah, yeah. he and Eisenhower or yeah. Patton. Yeah. Of course, Patton's odds with everybody. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. The Patton was at sometimes the Seventh Army. We were in the Seventh Army, and when uh, Patton was Third Army, and sometimes he'd want the Twelfth Army, and so they would just shift us over because we were usually side to side. As a matter of fact, that almost got me. <laughs> well, it did get a friend of mine. The man I told you, he said, I'll see you later in the mm -hmm. machine gun. He was on uh, guard duty that night with a machine gun. And somebody called and came up, the three guys came up, and he made them halt, and they gave him the wrong password. So he made them get down on their face in the mud. It was raining like crazy. It was cold until he could get the, somebody else up to check him out. Well, they checked him out, and it was a general and two colonels from the Third Army. Well, poor old Joe told me, he said, I thought I'd be shot at sunrise, because <laughs> he had had them down on their face in the mud. He said the general came up, stuck out his head, and said, well done. Really? Wow. So, <laughs> now, if that had been Patton, he yeah. had him shot. <laughs> but, but you never knew, because you had different passwords. Yeah, right, right. Of course, a password almost, almost got me shot. Really? What what happened there? Uh, in Hurlesheim, when I was a runner, and at night, you know, we had been given the password and the countersign. And I, I thought I knew where this one squad was. And so I banged on the door, it's kind of in a basement, and the guy asked for the password. And, you know, I forgot the darn thing. Couldn't remember that password. <laughs> And this is another quote, the next words were, should we let him in or should we shoot him? All of a sudden, boy, that password came back and it's never left in all these years. What was it? Fisk, F-I-S-K, you get a German to say Fisk, and you got trouble. The countersign was debris, and a German could not say debris. Oh, really? Oh, they knew the countersign, so we were okay. Wow. Well, years and years later, it had was uh, 1980. Six or eighty-seven. I met my company commander again for the first time. Hmm. And I said, Carl, I said, uh, I've never forgotten the password. The Hurlesheim night. He said, Oh, nobody knows that password. It's been so long ago. I said, I don't know. Nobody can remember that. I said, Boy, I can. And he said, Man, how could you do that? And I, so I told him the story. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that was good to know. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, wow. So there were little funny things, even though you're in the midst of that turmoil. And of course, that night when I was running, they were being shelled all the time. You'd have to hear them coming and squat down on deck and hope it went over. But uh, it was a pretty frightful night. Wow. Wow. I think actually 12 men got out that night, I mean, that were still left. Twelve or thirteen men got out. And, uh, well, as a matter of fact, and they might have been, and I've often wondered this, it might have been a couple that I was going out with, too, because we were in that 
it was a little uh, back of a uh, house in this town. It was kind of a shed-like thing you know, right in the corner. And they said, well, let's, there was a, gr a uh, barn door. And we knew it was, the field was out beyond that barn door. So they said, well, let's go out two at a time. So it said, so the line of two went out. And it came back to, I don't know, there might have been three of us left, maybe just two. It was our turn to go next, and that's when that first phosphor grenade, phosphorus mm. grenade, that, that killed that. Yeah, so you were that close from... Uh, so that close oh, to getting gee. through. Well, whether we'd have made it all, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. But yeah. they all did it out. But, uh. but uh, it's those little close calls. And then I've thought back, you know, somebody asked me one time, did you have a lot of close calls? And I said, no. Nah. And I got to thinking about it. And there were a lot of close calls. <laughs> Uh, well, you've, uh, through our conversation, you've, you've alluded to to your faith. Did you have a strong? Did your faith very, faith played in, very, into? Very. Okay. Yeah, I grew up with a very strong faith. And you think you have, that helped you make it through yes. that period? No yeah. question. Okay. No question yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. There was no kind of services or anything. You know, at that time there were no chaplains in the camp. But. Uh, there were others like me, then, and we would talk about it. But, uh, mm. So, I remember we spent one Easter in there, and I had grown up with Easter sunrise services. So I got out of bed before anybody else and went up a little hill by a fence and watched the sun come up. Wow. Uh. <laughs> That's as close as I could get. Yeah. <laughs> uh. No, no, it was a very important part of it. Yeah. And so now the, the British have liberated you. Uh, where did you go from there? I mean, it, what, what, what happened after that as far as... They uh, took us by truck to a little airfield right near there. And uh, I don't know how they decided who went to Oxford, England. But we, on that plane, all went to the hospital in Oxford, England. And uh, I can't remember, one of the general, general hospitals. Some of them went to Camp Lucky Strike and shipped out from there. And uh, so we were always kind of upset by that because we knew some of them were going right on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we were in the hospital for, uh, you know, I can't remember, I can't remember the day, but I do know uh, VE day came, we were still in the hospital. Oh, okay. But they had fed us slowly for about, oh, well, I think it was nine days. And then they felt that we were okay, we could go eat. But And then they uh, we were given a little bit of money and a pass to England, and we spent uh, three or four days in a YMC day type of thing before the ship left. Wow. Boy, it must have been nice to be in a, in a, in a bed with sheets and yeah, food well, and warmth. Well, and the hospital and... was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was. Yeah. Clean. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Right? Cleanliness. Yeah. Um, a hot shower? Yeah. yeah. So you weren't there after that then, so then you got on a ship and came back uh, back to the mm -hmm. States then, huh? Mm hmm We landed in Newport News, Virginia, and I think we were just there two days, and they put us on a train and sent us back to Fort Leavenworth, all of us who were going to that area. So we ended up where we started out. Wow. <laughs> Were you discharged at that point or just given a, a leave of... Uh... No, no, we're just given a leave, a re uh, recovery leave or whatever they called it at that time. I, I was home on the VE day. Oh, you were? Oh, okay. And right after that, I uh, went back to California to Fort Ord. And so that was another strange experience. Somehow we found out that they were going to use a lot of us as cadre to train the new new recruits. Well, that didn't sit well with, with me, you know. And <laughs> the sergeant came by one day, there were a bunch of us sitting out on a hill, and he said, any of you guys type? I never volunteered, ever. Right, and yeah. that's kind of the general rule. Well, I put my hand up. <laughs> I hadn't seen a typewriter since I was a sophomore in high school, and I wasn't very good then. <laughs> And so I got in the service record section and I spent the rest of the time doing service record section because I didn't want to fall on my face out in the dirt anymore. Sure. Well, fair <laughs> so, enough. Yeah. So, uh, so 
I was discharged from uh, Fort Ord. Roughly how long? Or roughly till December twenty second. Of forty five. No, no, not December first. January, January third or something like that. Uh, so you're in that uh, that much longer after? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. How boy, you think with. Uh, all you'd been through that you would have had enough points no, and such I, to... No, I didn't have quite enough points. Really? I'll be I done. really didn't yeah. until the end. But, uh, was there any worry uh, about you guys being transferred over to the uh, Pacific Theater? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We we thought we were. All of us thought we were. As soon as we got back to the States, we thought we were going right on through. Hmm. But, uh, hmm. but again, I think they saw the end coming. Mm -hmm. they, I think it was nearer than most people knew. Hmm. Uh, so. And I was home on VJ Day, and, uh, in the hospital on VE Day. And I remember very vividly. I vividly, I just went down, sat on a wall by the hospital, and just, just sat there, by myself. Mm. And at home, we were eating supper when the bells rang that that night. With my mom, and dad, and I. I left the table and went upstairs for a while, and then I walked up the bluffs overlooking the Missouri River and just kind of sat there looking at the river. <laughs> wow, wow. Now, did they ever talk about what they were, felt or were going through when you were... No. Uh, no, no. No. My family never did talk a lot. They were pretty quiet, and uh, no, they didn't. Uh, and, and how about yourself? I mean, we know today it's being diagnosed the, the post-traumatic stress and such. It wasn't back then. Do you do you feel like, how was it for you? That I guess my earlier question, the transition into the military, how was it your transition out of the military, particularly after all you'd been through? Uh, were you able to leave that behind you or did you have nightmares or how was how was your post-war? Uh, you know, that's a strange thing. I never did have flashbacks or nightmares until about 10 years ago. Really? And then that worried me, you know, and they, they've subsided. But uh, what, what do you think prompted it so later? It, yeah. I have the slightest idea. Huh. No. Uh, the transition out wasn't that that bad because I was still in. Now, had I just come out into civilian life like that, I think it would have been some. Hmm. Uh, but having been back in and still under control somewhat, loose as it was, it was still a control, you know. And I, I think that, that made it. Maybe that's what's happened to some of these men, that they're out just too bingo mm -hmm. too fast instead of spending six months in a camp just doing general stuff and still mm -hmm. under control. Of course, I just shake my head. I just, I don't know how those men do it. We knew who we were fighting. We knew where they were, were and we knew what we were supposed to do that day. Those poor guys. They don't know if the guy they're having breakfast with yeah, yeah. is going to get out of that night or not. They don't. And I just, there's where that traumatic thing has to be coming from. Yeah. I, I don't think most soldiers, if they had a job to do and they did it, and it was over, it was over. But these guys, I don't know. I mm -hmm. just really, we had a man, young man talk to the Lions Club recently. And I said, I probably shouldn't ask you this question. It had been in Afghanistan. I said, do you see a solution? He didn't say anything. He just kind of dropped his head. And I said, that's, that's all the answer I need. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't know how they handled it. Hmm. No, I really don't know of anybody who was with me that really had any kind of that kind really? of thing. Yeah. Of course, they may have, and we didn't recognize it then. We didn't know what it was. Right, 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 right or we didn't have ways to control it, or we didn't have people telling them, you might have trouble. I think that's part of it, you know. You tell somebody, you don't look too good. Enough times, pretty soon they don't feel good. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. So I, I think that could be it. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. So we'll move ahead now. Uh, you're out of the military. Uh, take your story from there. I had always decided I either wanted to go to the University of Colorado or Drake University in Iowa. And when I was discharged and I got off the train in Denver and took a bus to Boulder, and I don't know if you know Valmont Hill, was 
mm -hmm. boulder, mm -hmm. you come over the hill like that, and there's the flat ice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a full moonlight night, and snow was on the mountains. Came over the hill, and I like, oh, this is it. And I stayed. <laughs> I'll be done. And I stayed, and I stayed at the University of Colorado to graduation. You were able to take advantage of the GI Bill? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how it done otherwise. Uh -huh. One of the greatest things the government ever devised was the GI Bill. And after that, I went out to eastern Colorado to a town named Haxton and taught out there 15 years. I was a band director and choir director and counselor and assistant principal and all that stuff like little towns are. So you, uh, you got your degree in education or what did you get your Music education. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was out there. And I got married out there. And uh, our two sons were born there. And I don't know why I came to Fort Collins. I was having a great time out there, except a friend of mine called and said, Would you like to come teach in Fort Collins? And I said, Sure. <laughs> so I've been here since 1964. And, and combined, how many years were you in education? 35. 35 years. <laughs> And you've got the two sons? Two sons, uh huh? And grandchildren, great grandchildren? Oh, yes. I have seven grandchildren. Eleven great grandchildren. Oh. And by this time next year, it'll be 13 great grandchildren. <laughs> All right, with two on, Eleven with two on the way, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be done. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you'd mentioned in the. Uh, Oh, uh, talk a little bit about you meeting Lola and, 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 and how many years you've been married and, and such. A okay. Uh, went out to this little town you talked about faith. Well, I, of course, I had to find a church, and there was a church that suited me there, a Lutheran church. And so they said, uh, would you like to come to choir? Well, I'd sung all my life. And I said, sure. Well, I have another story to tell yeah, please. before we're done. And I said, sure. So I sat down in the back row and I sat there for a while and they were all looking around and I said, said to somebody, I said, who's the director? And they said, I said, oh no, no one's ever asked me. They said, well, you're the music teacher, so we just think. <laughs> so that was it and she sang in the choir. It was kind of funny, every Thursday night was a dance at the Legion Hall and then after choir practice, phew, she was gone. And I didn't dance. <laughs> but uh, a year later, well, yeah, about a year later, we were married. <laughs> and uh, we've been married, it'll be 61 years this this fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, this kind of plays in with your faith thing. So. When we were, went to uh, London, I from the hospital. In this YMCA room was a young man uh, who had been a prisoner of war. He was in the Air Force. He was a tail gunner on the B-24. And uh, his name was uh, Lacey D. Powell, which I thought was a great name. I'd never heard the name Lacey, mm -hmm. that man, but they tell me that's not an uncommon name mm -hmm. in the South. And so we got to bumming around England together, and sights or London, and sightseeing, and we came back on the same ship. And he had had a real kind of religious experience. I think when he was jumping out of that plane, probably. But but we had a lot of it was all prisoners of war on that ship. And they all had back pay, and the officers, the Air Corps officers, had been prisoners for a long time. And they had a lot of money, and poker games were big. I had never <laughs> seen that much money in my life. <laughs> they didn't know it existed. Well, Lacey says. You know it's coming Sunday, and some of these guys ought to be reacting with some kind of thanks that they're all still alive. I said we should have a church service. I said, Lacey, you're going to get us thrown off the boat. <laughs> both are so overboard, you know. And he said, Well, I'll I'll run the service, and he wasn't a preacher. I'll run the service if you'll lead the singing. So we went to the captain of the Liberty ship, and he said, Yeah, we got some little little. Hymnal little books, hymn books, and he gave them to us. So we called that service, and you know, that eating area was full. Those men came, and Lacey began to preach. 
And I don't think I've ever heard a more stirring really? from anybody today. And we sang. Nobody threw us over anymore, <laughs> but that was that was the thing. We had another experience on that ship. I'm rambling now. No, please, no, please do. Keep going. First night out from England, captain comes on. He said, "We thought you might be interested. We are the first boat to leave England, unescorted and fully lighted, since the war ended." He didn't have to tell me that. Well, I was worried about the Liberty ship anyhow, because yeah. I remembered about them falling apart. Yeah, Puget right. Yeah. Sound. He didn't have to tell me we were an escort and fully lighted. I thought maybe there's somebody out there holding a grudge. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so that was my trip home. I think. Yeah. Not eventful, no bad weather or anything? Uh, yes, bad yeah. weather. It was bad weather. That's one time I got sick unless I set up in the gun turret. Let the water come over, then I was okay. Mm. But, um, mm. but it was it was crowded again. It was it was not a luxury line yeah. either. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we were just glad to be going home. Oh sure. So. Certainly. Yeah. Now through the years that you've mentioned reunions and stuff, so I, I take it through the years you guys have kept in touch and gone to reunions and and I didn't know about my association. Well, I should have known. I didn't know about the association until 1984. Hmm. It had been going since 1946. Oh, really? Oh, wow. They had not missed a day or a year for reunion since 1946. 46, I mean, yeah. And I found about it by accident. I was wanting to know something about the division, and so I wrote to the a, uh, Bureau of Military History in Washington to see if there's anything about written about the division. Well, there has been a lot. And they wrote back and said, yes, and you have an association. And I didn't know I had an association. And the president lives in Seward, Nebraska. Hmm. My wife was taking care of one of our granddaughters, or my grandchildren, while my grandbaby was sick in the Omaha in the hospital. And that was on a Saturday. And I was going to be going through Seward on Monday. Now you talk about things falling into place. Yeah, I yeah. thought about that, you know. So I met the president and we went to our first reunion. My wife wasn't going to go and it was in um, Orlando, Florida. She said, well, you go on, I'll just stay in the motel room. I said, no, no, you're coming with me. Well, after about 30 minutes, she was over in the corner planning next year's trip to the next reunion because <laughs> she had been so embraced by everybody yeah. and that's the way they've been. And so we haven't missed one. As a matter of fact, we have one coming up in a week. We'll be going to Washington, D.C. Yeah. for another one. It has dwindled some, yeah. but uh, we expect around 400. A lot, oh, of, really? oh. a lot of them are sons and daughters okay. and things like that. And Actually, we have a group called Legacy Group that is now kind of running it, you know, and, uh, which is great, you know. So sit back, enjoy it, let mm -hmm. them run it. Mm -hmm. But that, that association has been going, and we have our 12th Armored Division Museum is in Abilene, Texas. Very nice museum. But good stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right now we happen to be looking for a World War II uh, ambulance. Do you know David Gloss? I don't. He was t talking with me. He was at the dinner. He was the interviewee. Kind of. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. And he gave me the name of somebody who has one that might want to get rid of it. So I haven't called him yet, but so we're looking for that. Oh, well. Another association has been going well. We publish our own newsletter. Has only missed one month since 1946. Wow. And uh, I write for it. I write for my battalion, and which is getting to be a chore to get news from you guys. Like you have to beg them to send you some news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, it's been an important part of our life. Sure. Now, have you ever had a chance to go back to Europe and retrace your... Uh, we did. We did. Uh, 1987, something like that, yeah. And we were on a tour with a bunch of high school kids. We had a band and a choir from Colorado. We were doing some performing. and We had a, um, a day off in Strasbourg, France. And it was just about Strasbourg where we were captured because 
one of the reasons that that drive across the Rhine, which was known as the Second Battle of the Bulge, that's what history that most people don't understand. Yeah, yeah. That was to, uh, part of the Bulge was to link up with Bastogne, to flank up the Bastogne. The other was to, <laughs> this is ridiculous, but it's the truth, to recapture uh, Strasbourg for uh, a birthday present for Hitler, and then go on down through southern France. Really? Oh, oh okay. wow. Brings it southern France under control. Well, Eisenhower and uh, wanted to pull all the Seventh Army troops. We were spread so thin, we were over so long. It's too, really too thin. He wanted to pull them back. De Gaulle said no. As a matter of fact, De Gaulle went to Britain, to London, to argue with Eisenhower because he said if we lost all of southern France again, it would be years before you'll ever get it back. So we stayed, and uh, that's what beat us to pieces, trying to hold that rich head. That, Later I read in the military history that our division was credited with breaking the point of that bridge yet, but at great, great loss. Mm. So, mm. Now we went back then, uh, when we, the two bus drivers who spoke French went with us, we rented a car in Strasbourg, and so we went north to Hurlesheim. But before we got there, I, I don't know if I, what I really wanted to go back for, I think partly was to see if my memory was playing tricks. And so we'd go along and before we'd get to there I'd tell my wife, I think that it's going to look like this, you know, because I, I was doing pretty good, I was, I was batting pretty good, you know, the lay of the land, what it would look like and this canal was over there, it was there, you know. So I said, I want to find the command post where we were captured if I can. And I said, if we find it, this is what it will look like. So I, because I didn't want to go someplace and all of a sudden, there it is. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'll tell you first what it's yeah. going to look like. And if you see it, you tell me. One of the wisest things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and so we couldn't find it. I said, well, let's go back to the middle, middle of the square. And I said, you, you do it. I won't tell you anything. But you turn around and you look down these streets. <clears throat> see if you see a, a house that looks like a window is actually jutting out into the street. Because that was where our first command post was before we moved across the street to this cellar. And she looks for a while and she says, well, I see one, that, would that be it? It looked like that. And so I looked and I said, yeah, that's what it looks like. So we were walking down the street and I said, do you remember what I told you it would look like if we see it? because I described what the house would be like if it were still there. Mm -hmm. Where the barn would sit, where this courtyard would be, where a little kind of a little shed with a roof over kind of off the barn. We walk along and sure enough she says, is that it? And it was. Wow. It was just as I remember it. Wow. There was nobody there. We wanted to talk to somebody. The only thing that was different, there was a tree where well, there didn't, there was no tree there at that time. But the, everything was just exactly the same. It looked like you could see the house had been repaired. Yeah, 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 sure. And everything else was there. The shed, the barn door, the fruit cellar, or whatever was run down, it was all there. What was going through your mind? Did that invoke any thoughts or yeah, memories or, or what? Oh, the... yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, that invoked even sounds. Really? It smells. Wow. It smells. Yeah. But uh, so successful, my mind had been clear. Yeah. But you know, I thought about that so much that you talked about flashbacks and things. I did have a lot, but they weren't really flashbacks. They would just be things going through my mind. You know. We. Well, yeah. I know many times I'd be in class and I'd be directing the choir, the band, or something. And the kids didn't know it, but there were even times when I was doing that. I'd have things going, you know, I'd be thinking about Hurlesheim and those things. And mainly I'd think, why was Dombrowski killed? Why was Ramsey killed? Huh. And uh, this was brought home to me after the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, I had a really great student at Pooter that just kind of went the trip when he went to Vietnam, the drug thing and everything. And he just, he was a mess when he came back. You know. And I talked to him about it, and uh, he was he was bound up in the prisoner of war, you know, 
free the POWs in Vietnam. And I, I saw it one time. I said, you know, Bill, I just it just breaks my heart that you're still involved with this. I said, there are soldiers who stayed where the war was, every war that has them, and there's some there. Do I think there are prisoners of war there now? I said, my heart says I wish they were. My head says no. And I wish you could somehow just get, get a hold of yourself, think about it, get out of this thing. And he became well irate and he said, well, he says, we have a thing called survival guilt, survivor guilt. Mm -hmm. I had never spoken harshly, really, to any kid I ever had in 35 years until then. I said, I said, don't you ever say that word to me again. I said, you didn't invent that word. Every soldier has had survivor yeah, guilt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you didn't know that I was on that podium and you were singing. Some of those days I was thinking about Dombrowski and Ramsey. You didn't know it. And I really felt bad about it. He left. And I saw his parents later. And I said, you know, I'd like to see Bill so I, I could apologize. And they, his mom says, I don't think you need an apology. He told us about that. And we think that's what really started him on the way to the recovery. Oh, wow. And now he's a very successful in this in Southern Colorado. Wow. Yeah. So, so this, these war things just go on and on. Yeah, and on. Yeah. And you don't know when they're going to crop up. I'm going to see a man I haven't seen since... October of 1944 in Washington. He wrote me, says, I'm going to the reunion. And I haven't seen him since then. Wow. Somebody said, well, you recognize him? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I'm anxious for that. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we'll start to wind down the interview. Okay. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Uh, any other stories that have kind of floated to the top while we've been talking here that you want to uh, bring out so that hopefully we've we've covered your story as best we can or, or do you think we or, is it, or do you think we did cover it? I think we did pretty well in my own personal feelings the times that I was afraid and the times that I wasn't sometimes I think we we weren't afraid because we would have been in trouble if we were we wouldn't have been able to move we'd have been petrified we saw a man like that that were petrified, couldn't move, and you had to move. But I just, just never, never felt that way. Well, what about like like a post battle? When I, I can imagine as you're going up to the battle, you're you're thinking, yeah, it'll be him or him, won't be me. And then when you're in the battle, you're probably running on adrenaline and such. But what 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 happens when you get back and and you're off the line or and you've got time to, to truly think about it? Does did you ever ever have issues with that? Where I, I think the one thing that would come up that if I had done something differently, would it made of a difference, or what did I, what did I do wrong, or did I really do what I think I did? I think that was the thing. Sometimes you get to thinking, well, I did this and I did, and then I think you thought you had you think back at maybe I really didn't do that, you know, hmm. or maybe I could have done that better. Or, it might have been easier if I'd have done this, or if I'd have found that tanker. Oh, that's one of the great stories of all times. <laughs> I was sent on, I told you, I said I thought I was sent the wrong direction after looking at maps now. And I cannot remember this man's name, but I was supposed to contact a tank commander. And to this day, I've always thought if I had ever found him, that whole thing might have turned. Wow. So then, then I get to think, of, I can't think that way because then I begin to think it was my fault because yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't yeah. find him. Yeah. Well, I never could find him. I just never could. And I looked and I never found him, but I knew his name. Now this sounds like it's made up. This is God's truth. I had to go through Fort Sam Houston when I was going to California after my furlough. I went into the day room. There sat a man with a 12th Armored Patch, and I went over and introduced myself, and he gave me his name, and I said, I'm glad to meet you. I've been looking for you since January 16th. And he said, were you the one that's supposed to come? I said, yep. Now, do you, 
boy, I'll tell you, the hair of Mars oh, stands sure. up just even yeah, telling yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of story keeps coming out. Ah, uh, wow. But would it have made a difference? I don't know. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't sit around and think that right. it would or uh, drive right. myself crazy. Absolutely. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, one last question I always like to ask in these interviews. How do you think that war experience affected your life, changed your life, played a role in your life? Or was it just simply a chapter of your life that you went through? How do you? How would you answer that? Hmm. I, I think I learned to accept things many times without question, or at least without, if not without question. I don't let little things worry me. I'm just not a worrier. And I look back at when I was a kid, and I was. Hmm. I really was. I worried about a lot of things. But I, I just thought, my gosh, if you live through that, you can handle most things. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be the, the big thing that I just got so I didn't worry. Yeah. I took things as they come. If they aren't the way I want it, so be it. Something else will show up. Yeah. And you had to do that in the battle. If you couldn't make that. If you couldn't get behind that tree, you found something else to get behind, you know, you just... Uh, I think I tend to uh, look at ramifications more than I did. I mean, there's, what are the ramifications if I do it this way? I think it was like that when I was doing the running through Hurlishheim. Mm -hmm. If I go this direction, Will that be better, or is there somebody out there that I'm going to be exposed that I can't get to? Maybe that's not so good. Maybe I do something. I think I, I tend to think that way even now, and I think that's that was part of it. I just, hmm. I think I thought clearer than I would. No, we don't. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our well, country. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a picture of when I first went into the 12th Armored Division. And uh, people always wondered about the set of the cap. The Armored Divisions moved their cap from one direction to the other. Oh, is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. it, uh, signifying uh, just... The Armored Divisions just always put their caps on one side, on the left side. Huh. These are our division insignia. And it says 12th Armored Division Hellcats. Had a great name, the Hellcats. Yeah, uh -huh. And it uh, lists the battles that we are, the Ardennes and the Rhineland and Central Europe on the side. And so that's one that came a little later, but that is what we go by now is the battles we were in. Or not the battles, the uh, areas we we're in. Okay. So this was the uh, patch that we wore on our left arm. Uh, Every armored division has the same patch, the same colors, same tracked head and the cannon in the middle, and it's just the uh, division number up at the top and they change. But anytime you see that particular patch, it denotes an armored division, and if there's a number that you can tell which one it is. So you were uh, 7th Army, uh, 12th Armored, uh, Battalion, uh, Platoon, Company, what, can you take us? Yes, the 17th Battalion. And we have a picture of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was a little quick with my question. Okay. Uh, this is our battalion insignia. This is on our battalion flag. And at one time there was a little uh, pin that had it. No one seems to know where they went or where they came from or where any of it are now. Uh, the Delinda Esmal simply means evil must be destroyed. In every armored division were uh, three battalions of infantry, and a battalion contained about 12,000 men, excuse me, 1,200 men. Okay. And within that battalion, there were companies. I happened to be Company A of the 17th Infantry Battalion. Uh, and there were three companies for a long time until near the end of the war when they brought in the black soldier. And that's the part I left out of the story, which is a vital part of the story. Please, please tell it now. Yes. Um, 
during most of the war, the black soldier was uh, in the Harve area, where, where uh, stevedores carried things. Toward the end, they needed more bodies, and they uh, they asked for volunteers to go to the front lines. Well, not many people like to volunteer to go to the front lines. Four thousand of these men volunteered. They gave them some kind of test. I never heard how, but they chose two thousand two hundred and twenty-one, and they had their own club until recently, and I understand that it's still going somewhat, but they were all put, they put a company in each infantry battalion. So we had a company A, B, C, and D, which was the black soldier in the 12th Armored. Um, they were commanded by white officers, and as I understand, were not allowed to go by the rank of sergeant, which is too bad. Uh, one. Congressional Medal of Honor from the 2020, 221 Club uh, was in our division. He was in the 56th uh, Battalion, and he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. These men served well. Uh, I have some stories about them, and particularly one of my friends, how they were treated afterwards. And uh, Yeah, how was that interaction with, uh, with all the prejudice and, and uh and such. Well, you know, they came in after I left the battalion. Oh, did you? Okay. And so I don't know, but I understand that uh, most of them accepted them very well. Some didn't. We had a lot of people from the South, south. Uh -huh. that were unsure about them or didn't know if they could do things very well, but that they did well. But as the way they were treated after the war. As a matter of fact, this one really good friend of mine who just died a year ago, a year ago about now, a uh, very dear friend of mine is uh, a black soldier, and he tells the story about when they were breaking up the divisions to send them home after the war, and they were trying to assign these black soldiers in different areas, and they would be assigned a company or a, to a company or something, and they'd go, and they said they'd come to the sergeants. And the sergeant said the story was always the same. Well, that must be a mistake. I'll call the captain or the lieutenant. So the lieutenant says, ah. It's out of my hands. It must be a mistake. I'll call the captain. He said, we knew what was going on. They just didn't want us. And so they were in Austria at that time, and he and four of his friends hitchhiked and walked in any way they could get to uh, Eisenhower's headquarters in northern Germany. And uh, said every place they would go along the way, if they say, well, your unit should be here, they'd say, well, they just moved out. And so they got to Eisenhower's headquarters, and nothing was happening. They said they found one young guard, said, well, if you uh, can come back Friday, I'll try to help you. In the meantime, they said uh, that their unit had been in La Havre, so they hitchhiked and walked to La Havre. Well, guess what? That company had just been shipped out someplace else. So they went back to Eisenhower's headquarters, and this young guard says, come Friday said they ushered him in, he and his four friends, and they said it was like an interrogation room. There was one bulb in the middle and some chairs, and, and the guard said, uh, just sit here and wait, and somebody will be in shortly. And so they waited about 15 minutes, and the door opened, and General Eisenhower walked in, and he said, and Walter says these were quotes, he said the first thing he said, I've heard about you boys, and you must be tired. Mm. He said he sat down and talked to him for 30 minutes. And the last thing he said is before they left is, remember, when you get out of the Army, if you want to get something done, go to the top. Well, that was about as top as you could get in the <laughs> Army. Yeah. You know? And so they were assigned a unit. Walter sent me the original order. He had kept it, the original order, signed by Eisenhower and Walter Bedell Smith who was Eisenhower's aide at the time, and I sent it, I made a copy, and I've got to find it, I sent it to our historian, and it has been lost, it never got to the museum, uh Oh. and I still think it's laying around someplace. Well, I have a copy, but it's not as good as the original, but he tells a wonderful story about, uh, about uh, how they retreated, Wow. but that was it. This is the... Uh, first telegram my folks got when uh, I was missing in action, and it was the time of the war that nobody wanted to see the Western Union person coming up the street. 
and I'll go ahead and read this, uh, this telegram. It, it reads, the Secretary of War desires me to express his deepest regret that your son, Private First Class William H. Funky Jr. has been reported missing in action since 18 January in France. If further details or other information are received, you will be promptly notified. Uh, this is the second one we got after we were liberated. I don't recall the date on it. It, it, it reads uh, May, May 12th, uh, 1945. Yeah, we were liberated in April 27th or something like that, so it was a little time before they got the notice. And this one reads, The Secretary of War desires me to express his, pleasant, his pleasure that your son, Private First Class Funky William H. Jr., returned to military control on 30 April 1945. So, as you said earlier, it wasn't uh, you were freed, you were returned to military control. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> uh, this little item is a spoon I used to eat when uh, in prison camp. We got usually a bowl of soup a day and a little, about a two inch cube of black bread, mainly made out of sawdust. I have no idea who the guy was who had the little pen knife, but several of us carved uh, little spoons so we could eat our soup with. And uh, I don't know if it holds whole soup now, but it's lasted this long. Oh, be darned. <laughs> wow. Very good. The Stars and Stripes was a uh, military uh, newspaper that made the rounds during the war and was published all during the war. And this was the one on uh, VE Day. And it was quite exciting to have this come out on uh, May 8th. And uh, great headline. <laughs> Very good.